Today, we will do another three levels of Thickness tutorial, and this time we are doing it in the style of Paul Kalkbrenner. He was the one actually inspired me a lot and make me realize how beautiful electronic music can be. And I'm sure there are millions of people that are inspired by his music. But we will start with the beginner level, sounding like this. And then investigate the pro level, sounding like this. Finally, we will reach the Paul Kalkbrenner, the master level, and it will sound like this. So, hop in. So the beginning producer hears that distorted kick sound of Paul Kalkbrenner and tries to replicate it. But rather than taking a clean kick sound and distorting it, they already take distorted kick and then start adding distortion. Turns into the big mush. And then of course a single layer bass with a lot of distortion. At this stage, you don't really know the side chain and groove and so on. And because of that, you try to solve everything with EQing. Once the beginners done this, they hear that Paul Kalkbrenner edits a lot of audio files, so they finding a good loop sounding like this. Of course, in this stage, you don't know much about audio editing, so what happens is that they take the piece they like most and just loop it. And this one sounds good, so they add another loop. At this stage, everything is quantized the grid, so you don't hear any really groove. Another thing is the sound selection is not really the top notch, so they try to get the one that they like most without really considering if it fits to the track. Meaning bringing the big clap, hats, they don't really care too much about amount of effects, so you'll start to hear reverbs are building up. And then another hat. And then a shaker. And then they run into a good vocal, they bring that in as well. And this is enough for trying to get into the arrangement for a beginner. So what happens in the beginner arrangement is that you often see this linear progression in the track. It's always additive and more and more things comes in all the time. The only things that you hear really is the simple filter automations. And that is the reason, even though we had the main idea, you will see that there are more and more lead sounds coming in, in during the arrangement session because they get tired of the idea and they add a new idea without taking off the other idea. The other typical thing is that because they want it to groove here, they actually add more and more percussion. So you often hear this type of a bit of random percussions. And sound selection is quite often. And altogether, a beginner track sounds like this.
the mix is really awful, the sounds are on top of each other, but if you just take one step back and listen to the ideas in the track, you realize that there are actually things that are nice, but the utilization and execution of the track is bad. And that means that if I hear this track from a beginner, I often say, you really have good ideas, you just need to produce more, and I'm sure you will get there. You have the juice. Which brings us to the pro level now. In pro level, things makes more sense and things get smoother as well. You will see that all of the good kick, a slight EQ, they understand that a good sample is always better than processing too much. And they bring in a bass sound that works with it. And they layer this bass with a nice swap bass, properly side chained. And then they group process properly and get the smooth sound. But the first thing that you realize is, because they want to make it perfect, they miss that raw sound of Paul Kalkbrenner, that raw kick sound, the raw low end. That makes pro tracks often too sterile, sterile, sterile too clean <laughs> compared to the Paul Kalkbrenner track. Then they will continue with the idea. And at this stage, of course, they understand a bit more about the sample and processing. For example, in this case, we have sample sounding like this. So there's a lot of Paul Clark Blender things in it, so they slice it up, find a groove that makes sense for them. But as you can understand, Paul Clark Blender's grooves are not that simple, there's always a lot of delay tricks. Hence they resample this one. So basically taking a piece of the sound that we had there, a small piece, and creating a dub groove out of it. Meaning that first we will have delay chains to create these delay forms. So if you saw this, means that all these different delays are different times, so they hit in a different times, creating that this swarm effect. On top of that, some of the delays, for example, the last chain here, the longer chain, is actually not timed, not synced, so there's like abrupt hit, and then say chain with another delay, so it's like a bit kind of da -da -da. And those ch delay chains even may include like the effects, so they make the sound even more interesting. And coupling with the reverb and delay, they sound like this. The one thing that's missing here is oftentimes what I hear in Kalkbrenner's track, it feels like he resamples the delays one more time. So resampling it one more layer and then even manually changing some of the sound, some of the delays, delay hits, making it even more interesting. And after that point, of course, dub and answer. first stage, this makes completely sense. They are similar sounds, they answer properly as well, but that is not really sound of Paul Kalkbrenner. You won't often hear that offbeat hits in Kalkbrenner tracks are much more aggressive, making it extremely iconic and easy to danceable. And at this stage, of course, you want to hear some hats to feel the groove. And then they bring a groove with the shaker and a percussion on top of that. The main issue that I see is that Kalkbrenner tracks always had this warehouse style big reverbs to give this really big ambience feeling from percussion's hi-hats. The pro producers often avoid this because hi-hats supposed to be going into small reverbs, so it creates this contained hat sound compared to the Paul Kalkbrenner sound. And together. At this point, you realize that it is sounding a little bit Paul Clark Benish, but it sounds much more cleaner. So the producer starts to add a bit more layers to compensate that effect. Adding extra sample grooves. Adding that clappy snare sound of Clark Benner. The biggest problem that I see oftentimes with the pro producers is that they go for a bit more complicated melodies. Not necessarily bad melodies, but melody being really long, it gets really harder to memorize the melody. Actually, Kalk Brandner's melodies, bright melodies, sits two octave above this. So if you take a look at, we are playing around E2, the C3, Paul Kalk is often sits, for example, E4, C4, somewhere around there, C5. So that very bright sound, that makes also sound a bit less 
hypnotic compared to the Kalkbender track. And of course, we bring a bit more percussion at this stage and go for the arrangement. So probably the pro producers follows my arrangement theory video. I'm ending it here and go for top down and take their loop into the full track. Pro producers are they don't have too much problem with creating track from a good loop. In the arrangement of the pro producers, you see that automations are smoother. They bring in and take off stuff to give this more energy control. And they don't have this super crazy effects. Rather, they have like a simple effects like this. Here, break. Very simple transition, but really fits the minimal effect of the sound. But if you take a look at the full track now, you will see that having a lot of knowledge actually make the track a bit too polished compared to Paul Kalk Banner. It sounds like this. And this brings us to the final stage, the master Paul Kalk banner. I mean using Altes Kamufel as a reference track. The most of the elements will be quite similar. I just add a couple of things that was not in the original track to make it a bit easier for me to explain it. Rather than starting with the kick, we will start with one of the most signature sound of Kalk banner, that real high pitch plucky guitar sound. I think in the original track, my guess is it was a guitar sound, pitch it up probably one or two octave to get this really bright sound. But actually Ableton has this tension instrument that gets quite nice guitar sound. And the sound design in this part is a bit different than the classical synthesizer sound design. So I had this original preset, play around to make it more guitarish, sounding like this. Stay sound. But to get that electric guitar sound, you have to really amplify the effects that you will use in electric guitar. So what I'm doing here, I started with reverb. So there's a slight tail on that. And then you would like to use kind of a cabinet overdrive amplifier. So in this case, I'm just using amp. Slight distortion, putting it to cabinet. Making it like a bit darker, kind of sitting in the room and driving it afterwards. Now it sounds more like electric guitar, aggressive electric guitar. And Redux gives this extra third, and then we add it in the glue compression. And then some EQing. Now we are getting this really dark but rich sound. And Sood is there for, because I don't want to really take my time to cut the super resonances. Sood just does it for me. And the most important step here is that dub delays. This is a very signature thing in Paul Kalkbinder tracks. So you have to take your time to create this, your dub delay chains. So in this case, I have the clean signal, the fast dubs, fast delays, and then mediums, a bit slower delays. Fast dubs sounds like this. And then the mid stops. And then you see that I'm also driving it to get this really dirty. And on top of that, you will also see that I'm playing with the feedback. So before the hit of the next one, I'm actually bringing down. Bring down. Like that. But that is not enough. That was also a similar thing that we see in the pro track. But what happens is this is resampled. So in this case, we had this resampled version. And then bits and pieces are taken out from the resampled version to give this organic feeling to the original sound. So together it will be like that. Then take a look what happens. You see what's happening? And then it's panned right and left a little bit. 
If you're enjoying the video up to now, if you feel like it's adding something to you, please subscribe to the channel and hit that like button. But let's jump back now. Resample your sound, chop it around, add more, automate more, resample it again to get this sound that's really unique for you. And the track opens like this, and then you have this classical Kalkbrenner kick sound. The most important thing probably is getting that tape saturation from the sound. Not that obvious, but just give it a slight saturation. The original sound was already saturated, so I didn't want to exaggerate it. And then the groovy bass sound. This is really important. So we are basically playing F sharp and F. But the most important thing over here, like if you think about the old school way, it was very popular to have the pitch bands in the modulation envelope. So you would actually do it here. You go this one and then you go for the MIDI and then pitch band and you can modulate it. To make it everything a bit clearer for easy for myself to explain, I actually kept everything here in the uh, automation part. And you will see that the when we go to F, we are actually putting it to the F sharp and bring it down, leading the sound. You will hear this trick a lot in Paul Kalkbender tracks. But the most important thing here is actually the sound itself, well, just a triangle curve. Richness to the sound comes from the distortion and compression that we are utilizing. So if I take this distortion and compression, let's put it here, and take other one, you will see that it's just a sine wave almost, or a triangle wave. And when you bring everything in, the sound gets much more interesting. There is a whole guitar pedal that's called Tube Screamer, so it's kind of modulating the Tube Screamer here. However, this is a layer with another a bit more screaming, distorted sound. In the second layer, rather than triangle, we this time utilize triangular sound. This is a waveform coming from Arturia Brute and it's from my analog techno sample pack. So basically you get this rather more distorted sound, or rather richer sound. Distorted a bit more, now we are getting much more harmonics on the high end and abuse the distortion guitar effects effect pedal. So I'm using the distortion, driving, putting it to the cabin, EQing out. And automating with the gain so that there's a bit quieted here and then when it screams it's a bit louder. Together. So this is something called offbeat hook. The main idea is you find something contrasting the kick really heavily, something really loud, so that when you dance, you can use that hook to dance a bit more crazy, like da na 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 It makes you easier to dance to. Again. Gets you into the mood. And Paul Kalkman uses this really a lot, all the time. And then I will jump actually straight into the hats and try to show you what I was talking about with big warehouse feel. So we will start with this simple hat sound. Together. But the main idea is putting into the big hole reverb. Increases size. And put a bit breath delay. We can hear the t t t t sound, so giving this really whole feeling to the track. We can decrease it more. The second layer is a bit softer. And together. We immediately get this cut when it grew out of it. But the funny thing that we haven't mentioned, and I should definitely mention, second layer of the bass is also having automation in itself. If I were to guess, he probably also resampled this one and played played with the modulation envelopes, but I did it with utility, so basically what is happening, here we are making it like a LFO to like, uh, uh, kind of sound, rather than always the same. Here. Da -da, da -da -da. So Paul Kalkbrenner is really like a master of resourcefulness. You always hear this kind of bits and pieces, small tricks making the sound interesting, even the track itself looping all the way until the end, 8 minutes. And then after that, you often hear this kind of percussive sound in the background. They are really quiet actually, but those nice sounds probably again resample somewhere else from maybe some pianos, maybe some other instrument, real world instruments. In this case, what I'm doing is actually resampling it from the grand piano in Ableton. So here, the original piano sound. 
using the same similar effects chain and using those dub delays getting into the this sound you see that here and there i'm changing the things around and the same idea here moving around creating my own form of resample sound this adds up to the sound giving a bit more groove And then we bring in the clap. And similarly, the track has another belly sound. Probably it's made from the guitar or organ sound, but we will keep the same idea. So the first layer sounds like this. And then we have another layer. And then another layer. The main idea is resampling again these sounds and playing around to make it more organized, making it a bit more interesting. End result was something like this. Again, I'm playing around with those tails all the time, creating my own dubs, my own delays to make it more unique. We are keeping the main idea here, adding all these effects on top of that and creating this unique sound of it. But here, for example, I'm using the operator. I think this was a preset. And here I'm using the resample piece from this one, taking it out and using it back again. And then from there, I'm using back again here. So it's really kind of more trial and error method, but the results oftentimes end up really this really lovely sound. So what I'm going to do, there are a couple of things that I want to also show you, but it is better to show them in the composition. So we will switch to the composition now. So the first thing that I will show you in the composition, blips. Blips are taking pieces from the original guitar sound and creating this kind of groove, pre-calling the break part in the track. Sounds like this. This helps the track to slowly develop here. It comes back to the resourcefulness of Paul Kalkbrenner, always like using the things already in the track in a nice way that everything starts to glue together. The other thing that I would like to show you actually, we have these distortion layers that we are sending. For example, here, if I play it, you will hear the bass. play with and without it. It just is adds additional layers, so you can have this distortion returns, so you can send a couple of different things here to make everything sound a bit glued together. And on the return chains, we have this different kind of big holes, room holes, mid holes to depending on what we want to do. If we want to get a bit reverb, for example, guitar sound, we can send a mid hole, so we keep this hole feeling all the time. And one final thing that we haven't discussed, maybe we can discuss this B thing that is here. It's basically taking a percussive sound here. Because this is in a loop and envelope, so the percussion sound loops that really fast and we are adding a bit vocoder delay and the some effects to make it really more ambient. So the original sound, if I take all the effects, <laughs> it's kind of like an engine starting, right? But we are doing adding a bit vocoder, delay, cutting all the lows. And of course, other thing is that we are automating this gain button so it gets brighter. And auto pan pans it around while moving. So creating this really authentic effects other than classic cheese risers. So let's do start then and I, I can in meantime try to show you around and enjoy the track. Let's go.
I actually strongly suggest you take a look at the project file if you want to understand a bit more in detail. I will put it on my Patreon as usual. But other than that, I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you learned something. And I will catch you next one. Goodbye.